You are now tuned in to the We Don't Play station where we don't play with information and everything else on the scene. You know, welcome to Friday, first of all. And it's a wonderful December. Everybody's doing great today. I hope you are, because I am. And today we have a guest. We have a special, special, special guest. And I can't wait for you guys to listen to her story, blend with her. And really, really feel the content in context. So, she's going to be joining us very soon. And I can't wait for you guys to really listen and understand where she's coming from. And how she's able to impact society with her experience. So, we're going to have an amazing time today. So, you guys stay tuned. Stay informed, stay up, and also stay blessed. By the way, you can rate this podcast on ratethispodcast.com forward slash we don't play. So without much further ado, I'm going to say that we're going to have a great day today. You have to stay positive about that mindset. You have to stay focused on that goal. And most importantly, you have to be part of that success. So... We're going to have an amazing time, so stick around, and in a couple of minutes, actually in a couple of seconds, she's going to be joining us very soon, so hang tight. Hey! Glad you said something, I was sitting there waiting. (laughs) I was like, what happened? (laughs) Yeah, I know. Well, because I still have the email from... The, you know, last week, and so I was trying to figure out which thing I must have hit the wrong link. So, no, you're sorry fine. Sorry about that. My fault. <laughs> you're fine. Welcome to the playroom, first and foremost, and happy December. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Happy December to you too. Yeah, it's it's a great time. You know, we were supposed to make it last week. Something happened. I'm sorry about that. It was just crazy. But I said <laughs> today we no definitely problem. have to, you know, keep in touch and. Also, shout out to Podmatch, because without Podmatch, we wouldn't have been able to have this amazing connection. And honestly, I would say your your profile is stunning. And you have a story that I definitely want to listen, especially during this session, just to understand those key point areas that really, really affect the human cycle. And also, you know, the social responsibility of being in contact with touch and with Mm -hmm. that feeling of, hey, I need to add life and value to this productivity Mm -hmm. that I'm bringing to the table. So let them know more about you and, you know, your name, what you do. And I just want to leave the floor to you so you can, you know, take the stage. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. My name is Elizabeth Myers and um, my husband is in the military for a little while longer, he's getting ready to retire. So we move around a whole bunch. We have eight kids, four boys and four girls. Um, our youngest is nine, our oldest is 22, and he's in the Marine Corps. So I'm an author, and that's my dog. <laughs> Her name is Hallie. She's a sweet golden doodle, but she likes to bark when people come in the door. Wow. Um, and so I have a blog. Um, it's at elizabethmyers.me. And I've written a book about a journey that I was on several years ago. Um, I lost my son in the second trimester. It just really kind of pushed me over the edge into a place of uh, depression, anxiety. I really just had a lot of doubts in my faith about where is God in the middle of all my suffering? What's going on? Um, How can an all good and all loving God let this kind of suffering happen in the world? And so through my time of struggling and wrestling with those things, I started journaling and long story short, that journal became a book. (laughs) And so the first book uh, is out and I'm working feverishly to get the second book out uh, right now as well. Wow. How can people find the book? How can they get it? Yeah, it's on Amazon. It's called Undefeated from Trial to Triumph, How to Stop Fighting the Wrong Battles and Start Living Victoriously. And my second book is called Undaunted, and it's your battle plan for victorious living. It's going to be out early in 2021. So I'm super excited about that. And then just this fall, I launched my podcast, Resilient Life Hacks, where I have people on, and they just 
tell about their journeys and struggles and how they overcame to give life hacks and tips to other people as they were going through their journey. Wow. I would definitely love to join your podcast soon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Because that's a very strong history. That's a very strong background because I'm imagining eight kids in 2020. <laughs> you know like how does that happen like my girlfriend she's the first one of five and i just have one brother so it's like you know and the story also you know we also had a few miscarriages here and there and when you think about it you're like how life works and how things happen you just don't know but if you're able to trust in god who actually made this possible then things can work because also my parents are both pastors. You know, we grew up in, in, in Kenya, but we're Nigerian and I had to take a whole different turn and understand, okay, this is a different society. This is a different culture. This is a different people and you're going to win some, you're going to lose some, but everybody's story is different. But I believe with the way your story has been built to this point, how will you say that you have grown closer to God in the midst of the trials and the tribulations and the storms and all those doubts that you could possibly think of, but still remain resilient and tenacity focused. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, you know, something that I've thought about a lot. Uh, Before I went through this difficult period of my life, I thought that I was really close with God. And, and I was in a lot of ways, but I think my faith was based more on this transactional view of God, where if I follow all the rules, if I do good things and don't do bad things, life's going to be sunshine and roses and everything's going to work out great. And that's just not the way life is. And when you experience a trial or trauma or tragedy, you come face to face with that fact that you can be doing all the things right, so to speak, and... Um, really tragic, really bad things can happen and bad things do happen to good people even in the presence of a good God and that was a very difficult struggle for me I kind of felt like the rug got ripped out from under my faith but it was in in processing all that and in, in talking to God with that with wrestling with these hard questions and these big ideas that kept me up at night uh, I eventually I came to the place where I realized that I don't actually want a God that I can understand I want a God that I can trust even when I don't understand because any God who's small enough for me to understand would never be worthy of my worship anyway. I don't even understand myself sometimes. <laughs> so right. something that's small enough for me to understand, that's that's not God. And um, so just be, learning to be okay and to rest in those mysteries of God when I don't understand, just learning to trust his heart, that he is good, that he loves me, that he's for me in spite of all these other things. That has built my faith on something so much stronger than the flimsy foundation it was on before. Now I feel like my sh- my faith is much more unshakable. That's actually the title of my third book. Oh, but, what's, um, the, what's the title of the third book again? It's Unshakable. So it's going to be Undefeated, Undaunted, and then Unshakable. Oh. I, I kind of just got into the un thing. You know, I'm even thinking <laughs> with your podcast, I'm even thinking, would it be nice for you to even bring out like highlights of this series like have like an undaunted series have like like make it such a playbook that when they're reading it it's like a movie but it's a real life scenario yeah yeah i i have a lot of ideas of things i want it's the time that (laughs) that gets in my way and i a lot of people are like how do you homeschool eight kids and write a book and i'm like well my husband took the kids camping a lot and that gave me a quiet space to work and so we, we have to get creative with a full house. Let me actually ask this. What would you say? No, let me ask this question like this. What is your opinion on homeschooling in today, in today's mm-hmm. world? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of funny with this whole quarantine thing. I was like, I'm, I was ready for the quarantine before it ever hit, long before it hit. Because we were already homeschooling. I was already, well, you know, we don't eat out a lot as a family anyway, just because of expenses. And I was already dying my own roots. So I was like, I I was ready to go for quarantine. (laughs) But um, it's been very interesting this year in particular because, you know, as a homeschooler, I've always felt a little bit an outsider, you know, or not as much anymore. It's become more more popular, more mainstream, but especially early on, you know, people kind of look at you sideways going, yeah, messing up your kids. Exactly. Um, And now it's like a lot of people are doing homeschool, even who 
don't want to or never thought that was a thing you know that's that's the best choice for their family this year and um so suddenly just to have you know this camaraderie this compassion people who looked at me judgmentally before or like now like oh wow how do you do it (laughs) (laughs) but um I have personally really enjoyed homeschooling with our family because I can tailor each education to each child. Um, We can decide what's best for that child at that time. And if they're ready to move on or go ahead, then we can. If they need to spend a little more time on a concept, then we can slow down and do that. We can repeat things. Um, So it's not really just learning to get a grade or to move on to the next level. It's learning for mastery. Like you, you, understand this concept and then you move on to the next concept but it's also enjoyable just to to learn together as a family and i i'm a lifelong learner myself so i really get a lot out of the things i'm teaching them i'm also learning some things i missed the first time around in my education so wow i really enjoy that too it's like it brings nostalgia back kind of sort of Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of things I, I missed. Like I, for me, history was just a bunch of memorizing dates and facts and things. But now to read history to my children as a story has been so powerful to me to help me understand a lot. Um, that history just ties into so many different other subjects as well. And like math, you know, I was always taught there's one right way to work every problem. Turns out there's not. <laughs> there's a lot of different ways you can approach each problem. And so yeah. being able to teach my children different ways to do it and say, hey, you pick the one that works best with your brain. You know, try them all out, figure out which one is easiest for you, and then do it that way. You don't have to just do it this one way. So I've learned all these different things. English grammar, somehow I skipped that in school. I don't know. Wow. But now I can, like, diagram a decent sentence and things. So. <laughs> That's great. Okay, when you think about homeschooling and training and adapting and mastery, I hear, I may be wrong, but I hear when you're at the age of about six or seven, that's when you can really tap into your your innate being that really pre- presents who you are. Because I was self-taught on the drums. Like, I taught myself how to play the drums when I was six. Now... I do these things with my eyes closed. I know where the snare is. I know where the cymbal is. I know exactly what I'm playing in my head. And I'm also left-handed because drums are played crossways. So it's like, so there's so many things that you have to think, okay, with your right, you have to receive, you know, like in Nigeria, it's more of like a custom tradition that, you know, when you're receiving something good or you're shaking someone's hand, either you kneel down, you bend down, or you use your right hand. If you use your left hand, it's kind of like a taboo. And I'm like, I'm left-handed, so how does that play into role? So when you think about culture, society, and all these displays, at what age does that really tap in into the intellect of mastery? Two years old, five months? Mm-hmm. Where do you see that yeah. across the I scale? I, I don't know that I can give you like a specific age. I know okay. there's like different kind of stages that children and that learning go through and um but they're not like strictly defined by stages i understand what you're you're saying about culture we spent a year in korea you know and learning all their little cultural nuances and actually my my parents-in-law right now are in uganda um and then because of covid and travel restrictions but they're they're kind of in flux between countries right wow. now but they minister um in northern africa or okay sub saharan africa um, but we uh, do the classical model of education in our homeschool, and so it kind of goes through like three different stages. So younger children, like early elementary, are more into rote memorization. You think about how easily children can remember a rhyme or a song, or you know, if you've read the same book to them a few times, they they know it word for word. They're just they're built to memorize facts, and they don't necessarily have to know what those facts mean at that time. You know, when they're younger. And then in upper elementary, you know, beginning in junior high, there's kind of a middle phase where they start making connections between all these things and start asking questions and, you know, go, well, why is it this way? Or what, you know, (laughs) you probably run into children that age, you know, in middle school who are are asking a lot of questions. Yeah. And then as they get older or progress in their learning, there's more a stage where they're able to speak their mind on things or to teach others, you know, kind of more rhetorical stage. And so actually, if we're learning anything new, even as an adult, we go through those three stages. Like, let's say, I I haven't ever played the drums, so let's say you were gonna teach me how to play the drums. You know, first I'd have to learn 
the vocabulary. Like, what is the snare? What, you know, you have to learn the basics. That's kind of the, the grammar phase of memorizing stuff. And then you kind of go through where you make the connections and you process. Maybe I'd ask you a bunch of questions of, well, how do I do this? Or why does it work this way? And then um, the third phase would be, you know, I'd actually be able to play in a band or teach someone else or something like that. So those are kind of the broad three levels of learning um, as I understand them. But I believe big picture, you know, God puts a unique purpose and special talents and gifts within each one of us. And they unfold as we go throughout our lives. I was young when I, I, I don't know, I guess as long as I can remember, I've enjoyed writing, but that didn't like turn into a book until I'd gone through certain life experiences that where I had something to say. Um, so it's just, you know, having, having those things that are within us develop and, and be unlocked so that God can use those. Yeah, that's a really great point you brought out because now it, it really shows that when you're able to tap into your genius being, you become more impactful to your society, you become more relevant, you become more of an asset, you become a solution, you become that that missing puzzle, you know, because most people don't say, oh, I don't have a talent. I don't know if I have a talent. And it's like, you actually do. You probably have never tried architecture you probably haven't tried you know it yeah. could be anything but i think it's when you're open to that fact that it's possible that mm -hmm. things that will come to you naturally because you have the habit of being in that paradigm or that shift of dynamic state of understanding then you're able to grow with it if you're surrounded by vinyls and cassette tapes and cds eventually you start breaking those things and before you know it, it it's a platinum disc you know that you have as a plaque because now you're kind of taking that that basic knowledge into actual fundamental understanding that this is where you're bringing it in and now that you even mentioned with kids and the homeschool before i get to the next question i would want to know like just because i'm just thinking how how is it possible eight 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 that number is in my head so like <laughs> when did you start like when was the process at what age did you start and, and and this is also because it's a mentally ready emotionally ready stable question of course financially to understand how you able to say okay i'm ready to have a kid or i'm 18 or i'm 38 you know where is that starting point for you and what was comfortable for you at the time so my my husband and i each come from a family with just two kids he has one brother and i have one sister so we were both from small families and we when we got married we didn't set out to have a large family we um both we attended college together at the air force academy in colorado springs and it, it wasn't until after graduation that we we started dating and so you know we dated for a couple of years and then we were married for a couple of years and then we started having kids so i was around 27 i think when our first son was born wow. and um at the time, my husband just wanted to have two, like our families had been. I wanted to have four because I wanted two boys and two girls. So we joke that we compromised by multiplying. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really what happened, but it makes a funny joke, I think. Um, right. But really, it was just more of a gradual process of, you know, as we had children, it's just like, this is fun. Let's keep going. Wow. <laughs> and I um, distinctly remember after my daughter was born, we had one son, one daughter, you know, that's kind of the point where we're sort of expected to stop. And I remember distinctly praying about that and going, okay, you know, is this, is this it? Is this our family? And I just had this overwhelming impression that somebody was missing from our family and, and that there was somebody else that needed to be there. I had no idea at the time how many somebody's were missing. And I'm glad that God keeps some things secret from us. Cause if he had told me then I would have run away. You know? Right. Uh, no, not your, I'm not your girl, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, he's just so neat how God leads us through things. And uh, I remember one of my later sons, it was a difficult birth and you know, I was like, Oh yeah, I'm definitely, definitely done after this, but just holding him, you know, when he was like less than two weeks old and just looking at what a miracle he is. And I'm like, how could I ever say, I don't want to be a part of this. And so um, it was hard in the early years, you know, having so many young ones. Now our youngest is nine. So I just feel like, whoa, this is easy. <laughs> we have six at home, two are grown and have, you know, launched into adulthood. Um, but we love it. You know, even just when some of our kids are gone, like, uh, you know, on a camping trip or over with friends or whatever, and we have just three or four at the table, it, 
feels kind of small and lonely and we're like we miss everybody so we've just gotten used to the noise and the chaos and the you know there's always something going on and and we just we love it we thrive in that environment that's beautiful that's a beautiful blessing honestly because now everybody's in unison it's a family unit and we are all here to help each other grow and it's more of a gradual process so it's like i know where we are and they know where i am and Mm -hmm. it's a beautiful moment okay yeah i think my personal opinion is it's really hard to be selfish when you're in a large family when you're living with that many people i think it's a really good character building opportunity because we all interact with all different varieties of personality you know i mean we, we have we run the gamut in our family and um you just you can't be selfish you can't just say i want this just for me you always have to be thinking of how your actions or what you're doing is going to impact somebody else that you're living with and i just think that's great training to be a mature and responsible adult mm. that's a core foundation actually just for social responsibility mm-hmm. yeah definitely i like that okay and in in everything that we do there's always a repercussion there's always a blessing there's always there's always a, a consequence there's, there's some form of reaction that happens and I also want to know, just based on your experience, like, what do you do when God doesn't make sense? Like, in some of the areas that you said it was hard for you, you know, when your son, you know, and when when he just, you know, like, you think about the moment he left and how it, it played a role in your day-to-day experience. And then God doesn't make sense in the process, but at the same time, you still have to keep going. So where did that question I won't say answered, but more, more peaceful in the mind. Yeah. You know, it's more about how how do we deal with that question? Than right. How do we find an answer to it? Yeah. Because there's not <laughs> necessarily a great answer, and uh, you know, we see glimpses of answers along the way, but we won't know the fullness of of why God allows certain things until we are in heaven with Him. Um, yeah. But that is a great question, and that was huge in uh, is a huge step in my healing, um, in my depression, my anxiety, and the way that I think about things was was learning to control my thoughts, learning to everything that I think doesn't have to be something that I own, and not every thought that I have is true, and just learning to kind of be the gatekeeper, and you know when a thought pops in my head, go well, does that line up with the truth that I know from God's word, and if it doesn't, I give it the boot and replace it with something else. And so I was doing that gradually over time. I was able to kind of flip my filter around. My problem had been that I was taking what I knew from my experience and I was taking that to God's word. And I was like, well, what God says about how he's going to love me and protect me isn't true because this bad thing happens to me. And so I was filtering God's word through my experience. But I flipped that around and I said, you know what? I know because I know because I know that God's word is true. And so in light of the fact that God loves me, that he gave Jesus to die for me, that that, that proves his love beyond a shadow of a doubt. If he, if he gave us that, won't he give us everything else that we need for life? And so knowing that, then how do I interpret my experiences through that truth? So I'm filtering my experiences through the truth that I know, rather than trying to edit God's word and, and decide if he was right or wrong about this or that or the other, uh, but just putting my life and my experience in the proper place And going, you know, God doesn't make sense a lot. And that's because he's so much bigger than we are. His plans are so much better. And eventually, I came to understand that if I knew all the details that God knows, and if my motives, my intentions, my heart were as pure as his are, then I would choose for myself exactly what he chose. Because he knows what's best. He knows what's right. And the reason why I think something else would be better or why I don't want his will or you know xyz fill in the blank is because I don't have all the facts I don't understand all the details there's there's just things so many things that are unknowable to me and my motives aren't always pure you know a lot of times I'm just selfishly wanting what's comfortable for me what's in my comfort zone not necessarily what's best for me or best for those around me so just owning that embracing that truth of if I, if I were God, I would choose this too, has really, really helped me when I don't understand just to acknowledge that I don't have the facts. And um, that, that helps me get through those times in life when that question pops up. That's deep. That's deep. Because now you, you literally take yourself in as 
somebody who is part of the process, which is trusting the process, knowing that there is a better reason for why this is happening today. Mm-hmm. And I was reading um, one of my friend's Instagram stories. His name is Bright. And he was even quoting and talking about how we're so concerned with how we want to be in a place we want to be tomorrow, yet where we are is where we was where we wanted to be yesterday. So <laughs> it's so true. It's like why are we fighting for that 2030 vision when 2020 vision was tw- in 2010, and now we're here and you're like, oh, okay. So so did you prepare to get there or did you just find yourself there by accident? So. It's like those things we think about and it's like, okay, God knows why this is happening in this year for this reason. If this year went differently, I'm sure a lot of things like Zoom would not be really making relevance in today's world, you know, or Netflix like it is now. So all these things play a role into our social media cues, into what we actually do with our time. And also that plays a role in our physical health. So how does that even affect your health, your mindset, your emotions, your spirit, how does this connect for you whereby it's not so burdening and at the same time you're able to enjoy the process because this is what has been given to you as the ability of his grace? Yeah, I have really learned over the the years of, of struggling through this and then studying all of this that our beings, are we are so integrated. Our spirit our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and our body are just completely integrated with one another, and we can't separate them out. And I think particularly in Western culture, Christianity, we tend to ignore the importance of the physical body. We kind of, we focus on, you know, the mind, the heart, the spirit, we, we focus on those things, but we don't uh, realize how much our physical body affects those things and how much they affect each other. And so that the book that I'm working on now actually goes goes into those four areas, physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, because those are the four areas where I started to fight back against my depression and just take little baby steps. Um, I, I reconnected with God. You know, I started journaling. I got counseling help. I got um, medical help. And I also started to take better care of my body and eating, resting, um, exercising, you know, with homeschooling eight kids taking care of myself was at the bottom of the list I was always rushing around taking care of everybody else and I totally neglected self-care I kind of you know thought it's you know Jesus first other second you last kind of mentality but um I mean it's not a selfish all about me 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 kind of a thing but we we have to take care of the bodies that God has entrusted to us or you know we're just gonna wear down and quit and so my philosophy about um, our body and nourishing it, strengthening it, is that is the vehicle that enables us to do the things that God's called us to do. And that's kind of the whole premise of what I write about is is overcoming adversity and, and dealing with our things because we all have issues, we all have brokenness, and dealing with that and searching that for, for those nuggets that God has blessed us with in the midst of those trials and then using that to live out our purpose for what we were, the thing that we were born to do. Yeah, And we can't do that thing if we're still caught up in our own brokenness, as I was for a long time. I was stuck in that place. I had to get unstuck before I could do things that God was asking me to do. And self-care is a big part of that, taking care of our own bodies so that we can have the energy and the ability to do the things that we're born to do. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point you mentioned because you said like the body is a machine if the body is a machine then we need to feed it the right way when you know my mother always says you are what you eat you know if you eat a large pizza every day yeah. don't expect to be looking like a six-pack figure bodybuilder in the middle of the summer in the olympics you know it's not gonna work because you need to also know that your body is your fuel. It's what you feed. It's, it's the water you drink. Is it alkaline? Is it acidic? You know, do you know what is the, the main purpose of you consuming this product to your body cells and, you know, nurturing and giving yourself that growth sprout? And even with my music as well, there's a song that I put out. It's called God's Handwriting. And it's off the EP um, Road to Universal 2. And I first of all said... In pidgin English, I said, you know, when you're running, you get tired. 
and your body is not a machine so you have to really live your life according to god's purpose because god literally has a handwriting of your life he knows how it starts he knows how it ends so if you don't fall in line with that handwriting you start writing your own verses and then you start you know flipping pages before you know it you're, you're stressed because now there's so much overload so now you have to be more specific into how you treat your body how do you exercise well, that's one thing for me too i've been really trying to figure out exercising in the pandemic do i go to la fitness uh, or you know lifestyle and work out and wear a mask or just work work out and stay at home and move around because those things really play a role but also for you how do you play into all that the working out the reading the self-care it's i'm just thinking i don't know i've never been in, in that household with eight kids maybe one day you never know we might have that yeah. but just to prepare people who are in those families or from those families or can it relate or probably want to just understand or just be part of that zone for a little bit how do you relate all those points and you know see god in a different light where suffering is also a process factor mm -hmm. it, you know it looks different in different stages of life um, you know, when, when my kids were younger, a lot of my self-care time would happen during nap time. I'm convinced that God made young children nap for the sake of the mother, not for their sake. <laughs> <laughs> and all my kids, I'm like, you will nap until you go to kindergarten, you know, until you're like five or whatever. And so even when they wouldn't, you know, when they kind of got out of the phase of they're not really necessarily sleeping anymore, I, I'd be like, you just, you need to have a rest time for a little bit each day because that was my chance to kind of catch my breath. Um, once they got all older and everybody was sleeping through the night, then I, you know, since then I've been able to sometimes wake up before them and uh, knock some things out of the way. I like to do my, my quiet time, you know, Bible and prayer in the morning. And I have gone through phases where I do my workouts early in the morning. Um, and then other times I've done it in the afternoon and I've gone through different things that I, you know, sometimes I've gone to the gym for a while. I was really into running, but I did. I did three marathons in 13 months, and then my body kind of said, uh-uh, no more running. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking a break from running for now. Um, I, I had hip surgery earlier this year, and so I'm still trying to get back on track from that. Um, but another thing that I did, too, when they were younger is just put, I had the double stroller, you know, because I always had at least two little ones. I'd plunk them in the stroller and go for a walk, and pushing a double stroller, especially up a hill, is quite the workout. Mm. Um I've always said that carrying laundry up and down stairs ought to count as a workout. So, because there were many years where, you know, you go to the doctor and they're like, do you do 30 minutes of heart raising exercise three times a week or whatever? And I was like, no, you know, when I answered their questions the way they word them, I would come out with sedentary lifestyle. I'm like, there's no way I have a sedentary lifestyle. I never sit down. Oh, so yeah. I think there needs to be like a special health checklist for moms of all the other things that count as physical credit. <laughs> But even just walking, you know, just walking 15 minutes a day is great exercise for a lot of people. Mm. And there's just so many health benefits even to just that. And even just being outside, getting vitamin D and um, just enjoying God's creation. There, there's so many good things about that. Yeah. Speaking of, of God's creation, too, I was just talking about fruits, literally fruits in the last episode. And I was telling people how to actually blend these fruits how do these fruits help you? How do the, does it like affect your life? And even fruits like strawberries, you think, oh, strawberries are little, but they actually have more vitamin C than oranges. And someone will be like, oh, an orange is so big. Why not? Yeah. So you think about how God works in those minute things that you think are small and mighty. But to you, you're like, oh, it's just a passing by situation. But no, it's like everything that we learn, the more we know, the more we don't. Let me just put it like that because it's like, oh, if we know about this, then what else is there for us that we should know about? And then that curiosity factor comes in. And as humans, we're always curious about the next new thing or the next big thing. So it's like, how do we play all these roles and still remain sane? <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really, really big. And for you, how have you been able to build that resilient lifestyle to the point where now, like you said, yeah, yeah, my, my, my kid is nine and. I'm fine. You know, like I don't have to think about anything because I've gone through the other seven, eight, nine, ten experiences and seen that, okay, this is the model. This is the modular. And you said that 
you don't have to use the same method for everyone so that resilience and that tenacity how have you bridged across that for everyone even even for your husband too like time to spend with him like all those things play a role so how does it work for you with work schedules of course morning and nights how does that play around yeah, I think a lot of it, I just encourage people to take baby steps and build small habits. I think kind of like you were saying with the fruit, it's a little step consistently, like every day or every week, however that fits in with your schedule, is better than doing a big spurt all at once and then doing nothing for months and then trying really hard again. Um, so I think even just small changes, um, uh, there's been different times in my life where I've tried to work on my diet, for example, and eat healthier. And if I focus on, well, I'm not gonna eat this and I'm not gonna eat that and I'm not gonna eat that, that gets old real quick. But if I just think of, okay, I'm gonna add in an extra serving of fresh vegetables every day. You know, then I'm adding that in. Well, by definition, if I'm filling up with some of that, there's some other junk I'm not eating, but I'm not focused on the junk I'm not eating. I'm focused on the nourishment that I'm taking in and how I wanna treat my body healthily. And again, that was, being, living in Korea had a big influence on me in that because they view all food as like a form of medicine. Every time you eat something or have a meal with somebody, they're like, well, this thing is good for that and this helps you with that. And um, they don't view food as the way I think we do in America of, of just what tastes good or what feels good or, you know, eat. It, it's all their whole mindset is what is this that I eat going to do to my body? And I think I. I know I could benefit from a little bit more of that type of mindset rather than what am I craving right now? What would be fun to eat <laughs> <laughs> to think what, is, what does my body actually need? Not what do I crave? Um, but you know, just a little bit at a time, you know, doing little steps like, you know, starting a prayer time with God in the morning or, you know, take a walk around the block. Um, and once one thing becomes a habit, you know, then you can add another habit to it. But trying to make it just like brushing your teeth. I use that example because for me, if I don't brush my teeth, like, you know, they just feel kind of furry and gross. And like, eh. so, you know, when you get a habit to that level where you feel wrong if you don't do it, you know, then you know that that little baby step has become a part of your life. And then you can add another little baby step on. And they just kind of build up over time. Yeah. That's a good point because now you, you actually enjoy the process of being in that moment rather than mm -hmm. trying to be where you think you should be in the next five minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I miss it if I don't do it or I, or I feel bad, you know, I, physically or, you know, spiritually I feel distant from God or maybe my mental health isn't squared away in the, in the healthy place. You know, when I don't do the things I, I know I need to do to take care of myself, then there are consequences to that. And I think when we're younger, you know, we can run from those consequences a little bit better. You know, as you get older, they catch up with you and um, they and they build up over time, I think. I, I always enjoy repeating Indiana Jones' quote about, it's not the years, it's the mileage. And mm. I, I have a lot of mileage. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, you definitely have a record. It's like those yeah. the Guinness Book of Records kind of... Yeah, don't, don't, you, when you come to me, come to me correctly because <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot to tell you. I have a lot of experiences to show. And it plays a role because that also builds into character. Like you said, when you're able to have this tenacious, you know, mindset, nothing can pass you easily. Now you have like eight signals hitting at the same time compared to somebody who is just laxity focused or maybe even laxity unbothered. You know, it's, it's like, the point of being focused in the moment of doing something for your benefit is really ignored because people are focusing on how do I get this today? How do I make a hundred dollars today? How do I, you know, get the next big lottery win? Like, it's like you're so attached to the price that you forgot about how long it took to set that price point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I kind of compare it to like, if you're on a boat in the ocean, you know, are you just going to drift and go wherever the current takes you? Or are you going to set a course and say, I want to get there and this is how I'm going to get from point A to point B and to kind of be deliberate about that and be deliberate about what you say yes to and what you say no to. Cause every time we say yes to one thing that we have to say no to some other things. I, I am the queen of like over volunteering myself. And so I'm very thankful for my husband. Who's like, do you really need to do another thing right now, hun? He kind of keeps me in check on that one sometimes. Nice. But, it, you know, whenever I say yes to one project, that means I've got to say no to something else because we just we don't have unlimited time and energy. We just don't. You know, as much as I would love to be super mom, I'm not. And I just need to accept that fact. So 
as we're charting our course, you know, across the ocean, that's deciding, you know, am I going to turn here or am I not going to turn here? Am I going to go straight? Am I going to pause here? Am I going to stop and refuel? Um, but the, the other alternative is just you kind of just drift wherever life blows you and you're not necessarily having a plan. It's just, you know, different things in life bump into you and knock you around. And, and one day you may wake up and go, well, this is not where I wanted to be at this point. Um, so I think, you know, just kind of with the Holy Spirit's help, being the captain of our ship and, and driving ourselves intentionally to where we need to go is a, is a big thing. Yeah. It's a big thing when you, when you also find that what you're doing is feeling right and you have peace of mind, because Mm -hmm. even if you think about it in relationships and people who let's say have kids and they, they didn't like the person they're with, or they don't want to be the person it's like, it changes the character buildup as well because it has a psychological framework to it. So if there's anybody who's out there listening, what would you tell someone in that kind of moment that is not sure about where they are, but they're sure of what they're doing, if that makes sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, in my book, I talk about these four areas of spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally. And I feel like the spiritual aspects of our being sort of trump all the others. Um, if we're strong in our spirit and our connection with God, that can make up for a host of other weaknesses. But if we're strong in every other area, but we're missing that connection with God, that relationship, then everything's going to fall apart eventually. We just we need that, that connection, that power, that love and grace within our lives. And so what I encourage people who are kind of like, oh, I don't know where to start. You know, I know I, I need to change something. I don't know what to do. Um, I always say start with with prayer and connect with God. Just I think some people get intimidated by prayer because they're like, I don't know what to say. But it's just it's just a conversation. And it's great because God already knows our hearts anyway. So it doesn't even matter if we get the words. There's no such thing as having the right words for a prayer. It's just turning your heart to God and just, you know, longing for that connection. And I think as we grow closer in that relationship, then he will reveal the next best step for us because it's everybody's past not going to look the same. Um, there's we have a lot of common things and there are some things, you know, that will work for a lot of people. There's some things that work for me that won't work for you and vice versa. You know, so I think God is gracious to give us each a kind of an individualized plan to move forward. But I definitely think that is the, the starting place, you know, to get connected. Um, I actually have a, a free prayer guide that's on my website. If, it, if you go to elizabethmyers.me slash prayer guide, um, you can download that there. And it's kind of based off the, the Lord's Prayer because I used to feel like my prayer was just gimme, gimme, gimme. It was like a wish list for Santa. And it just wasn't very satisfying. <laughs> right. I'm like, how can I pray better? And so I just, I took that as a model. Okay. Because I, I know the words so rote that you know, they've almost lost their meaning to me, mm. but, um, just taking that as a model of, you know, we praise, you know, confession, thanks, interceding for others, asking God's help for my day today for myself, all these different things. And that has really revolutionized the way that I'm able to communicate with God, to have this kind of map where I never come to God and go, I don't know what to say. You know, I, I have a place to get started there. And once you get connected, you know, God will keep showing you more things to pray about. So that's true that's true and even about prayer like you've mentioned i know there are people who have probably experienced depression anxiety pregnancy loss and those are things that you don't want to you don't want to think about them but when they happen you have to think about them but when you think about them how do you process them like you said there's no answer to that question but there's a peace of mind and there's an understanding that helps you understand why it happened so what would you tell someone that is going through this moment of truth? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I went for a lot of years just kind of trying to power on in spite of the pain that I had inside. Just putting that facade on the outside that, you know, I'm fine. I put a smile on. I try to pretend, try to fake it, try to keep going. Um, it was difficult finding people that really understood the pain that I was feeling because we, our culture doesn't really know how to grieve the loss of a child that wasn't born. And um, so my son Timothy was very much real to me, but not as much so to other people um, because he wasn't ever, you know, actually born alive. He was still born in my hand while we were on vacation. And so 
that just really got me stuck in that place of grief. And then there's this whole stigma sometimes with mental health um, issues, particularly in the military and particularly in Christian communities. And so I was afraid to ask for help. I was embarrassed to say, I don't feel right. I felt like Christians are supposed to be full of peace and joy. I was depressed and anxious. You know, what, what's wrong with me? What am I, you know, and I prayed and prayed and begged God to take it away. And it, it wouldn't, I wanted it just to evaporate. But God wanted to walk me through this path um, with him of, you know, being a partner in my healing with him. Um, so I would just encourage people to reach out and get help. And it's, it's okay. It's so much better. Once I started reaching out and, and getting help, it was not the big scary thing that I had imagined it to be. And, you know, even now, I, you know, I used to be ashamed of my mental health problems. And now I'm like, I'm on podcasts, I'm writing books about it. I do all these things. And it, when you drag that thing out into the light, it loses its power over you. You know, it's, it's not a thing anymore. And now I can use my stories to help other people. So I just really encourage people to get uh, whatever kind of help they need. It might be reaching out to a friend, a family member, going to Christian counseling, talking with your doctor. Um, I, in my case, medications were very helpful for my mental health. And uh, you need to talk to your doctor about that. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I can't give medical advice, but, right. um, and every situation is different. Um, I, I, you know, I also went to my pastor, like I said, I started journaling, did Christian counseling, I got into a fitness program. So there's lots of ways that you can get help depending on where you are and, and what specifically is going on with you. But I would just say you you don't have to go it alone. You're not alone. You're not the only person, especially this year. I think even people who've never struggled with anxiety or depression are, are having a hard time this year. It's just hard. It's hard to deal with all that stuff. And we just need to reach out for help with one another and support each other and not not judge one another because we're like I said earlier we're all broken we all have issues and we just need to bring them all to Jesus exactly that's a strong point and it it makes more sense now when you think about how the world revolves around you based on how you view it because now you you think about like you said in the Christian church there's there's a lot of politics going on and you don't want to be part of it because you don't want to be the laughing stock and at the same time you're looking for help so it's like do i tell you about it or do i just pray to god and god answers me and then speaks through you so it's like mm -hmm. there's always that tension and at the same time when you believe in what you know and you're able to you know of course give it to god first then he opens up your heart and gives you that reason to be more rewarding in speech because now you're not really saying things to harm somebody or saying things to spite somebody. It's more of, this is what I've gone through. And if you're hurt or if you're embarrassed by me, then that's on you because you probably have your own insecurities. And mm -hmm. most of the time, it's pretty much people imposing their fears on you because their experiences made them feel a certain type of way that they, do, they wouldn't want you to feel but it's your experience and your process. And then when you understand that process, it builds that resilience along the line of this is where I've been, this is where I am, and this is where I could be. And if I could be here tomorrow, what do I need to do today to now put my mind in place to accept what comes to me? Because some people may be ready for that success, but because they're not mentally ready, that stability is not gonna help them and keep going. And then the sustainability process now takes over and then you start drowning in the success because you didn't have that foundation you didn't have that you know talk with god like you said there's people who just don't know how to pray there are people who don't speak in tongues all these things are very specially treated in different communities but because we have like you said a god that we don't understand but we trust is the more reason to fear him so that we can have the wisdom to bring out ourselves to the light which now exposes him through us so it's like you bring your problems you bring your downfalls for someone to now get lifted but before they're lifted you have to understand that i had to go through this jesus had to go through dying on the cross to get us salvation is if he didn't die on the cross it would just be okay what what did you sacrifice what did you give and even us how do we give the next person there are people who walk around us they might be angels you may never know and you may miss your opportunity so it's like how you so spiritually inclined to the solution 
without neglecting the fact that what you're going through is actually a stepping stone to your next miracle or your next breakthrough. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I think that God can redeem anything that we surrender to him. I love the scripture in Genesis that says, you know, people intended this for harm or for evil, but God intended it for good. And he can take those those painful things in our life and bring good from those, bring beauty from ashes. And I think sometimes it's up to us to kind of go back and, and mine those things and, and look for those gold nuggets that were hidden there all along. And I think often our greatest point of pain in our lives is often where we have the greatest opportunity for ministry to other people. Um, there's a, another verse that talks about we will comfort others with the comfort that God himself gave us. And I think when God shows himself strong in our weakness and he shows his, he shines his light through our brokenness. And I think that's where we can really minister well to other people when we take our hurts and our pains and our brokenness to him for healing and say, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? And, and he'll show us. Yeah. It's, it's a perfect way to have that overcoming joy in every adversity that we go through because when you overcome adversity it's like you have you have a key and when you have a key it opens a door so i would ask you what keys did you unlock or how did you even find those keys to overcome those those doubts those adversities those triumphs and tribulations that you know were in and out of wins and losses in terms of how you're able to scale through the the life cycle yeah, for me, it was a lot of trial and error initially. Okay. And it, like I said, I kind of tried to hide it for a while, but I just, I couldn't anymore. I got to the place where that burden was too big to carry alone. And I think change is hard for people. We don't necessarily like to change unless we have to. And for me, I got to the point where the, the pain of changing was less than the pain of staying the same. It hurt more to stay stuck than it did to, to take these scary steps to, to reach out for help. And I remember distinctly a conversation I had with my husband saying, I just, I do not feel right. Something is wrong and I don't know what it is. I didn't know if, you know, am I tired all the time because I'm depressed or am I depressed because I'm exhausted and I'm unmotivated and, and that's, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Or, right. or is all of this a spiritual problem I bought it upon myself because I'm angry with God and he's just mad at me and he's punishing me. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what the root cause was. I, I read a bunch of stuff of like, oh, you're missing vitamin B or, you know, you need to do this or, uh, you know, all the prayers I pray to just, Lord, just take it from me, just take it away. And so I tried, I tried all these other things and um, I just was not seeing relief. And so that's when I said, you know what, I, I don't know what the root is. I'm just going to attack it on all four fronts. This is my military training coming out here. <laughs> but so I just decided, you know, at the same time, I'm going to just take baby steps physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. And it was just kind of trial and error of, uh, you know, which things help me to feel better and more healthy and more whole and, and which things made my issues worse. Um, and so it was just, and as I said earlier, you know, as we pray to God, he kind of shows us the next step or he opens the next door. So, you know, once I kind of got on that path and got some momentum build up, you know, I felt like God was just guiding me to the next best baby step. That's beautiful. I think at this point, when people listen to this, they'll be thinking more of how can I get through with my own keys to my own success story? Because your story will build somebody else's resilience and somebody else's trust in God and in themselves to really come out and say, if this person could do it, then I can do it. You know, people always compare and say, what does he have? What does she have? Does she think she's the best? Does he think he's bigger than everybody? But at the end of the day, it's more of so, what are you leaving behind? What are you actually saying to somebody? Like, are you helping them or are you just spising them? Are you, are you in the middle of their problem or are you in the middle of their solution? You either or. You could be toxic <laughs> or you could be the best thing that has ever happened to this person. But I think it's also based on somebody's past and somebody trying to understand that, hey, this is where I've been. This is where I want to be. But also knowing that change is inevitable. Like you can't be a baby forever. If you are, this would be a I don't even know what kind of world we'll be living in. But 
you think about that growth, that 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 chance to say, okay, let me make this change today. If it doesn't affect me, okay, I'll move on. But I think, like you said, when you're able to make that decision, it changes the the way you do things. And this would even be my last question. Based on everything that you have gone through and you have experienced, would you say that podcasting and writing books and talking to people is a form of therapy somebody can take into perspective where you're able to just say, okay, maybe I don't know anybody to talk to, but I can write it out in a diary or in a book that can now give me insight on myself and then somebody else can read it later and then I can be able to get that visualization for the next thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. There were so many times when I was writing the first book and I'm like, you know what, if I'm the only person that ever reads this, it was worth it writing it just to to get my thoughts down to get a clear understanding of my journey and where I am and who I am in Christ and um, I, I think it definitely is I mean that's really how it started it was my, a journal for myself and I was like three quarters of the way through the first notebook and I'm like you know what other people could benefit from this mm. and I I kind of felt like God was nudging me saying don't hoard this you know I he blesses us not just to bless us but so that we'll be a blessing to others And, um, you know, you were talking about people helping others or judging others. I think a lot of times when we're dealing with a person who has not yet dealt with their own pain in their past or maybe their present and they're they're still wrestling with that, still struggling, struggling, that's weighing them down. I think those are the people who tend to look at others and criticize and judge and and condemn because they're in a bad place themselves. But I think the, the people who have gone through stuff and who have walked that hard road and been healed and found hope those are the people who will turn to others and encourage them my level of compassion has gotten so much deeper after i've gone through this and i you know i know before in my younger years when i thought i had it all together and whatever you know and it was easy for me to look at somebody else and go well you're in that situation because you made a bad choice in life or whatever Mm. um but now no there's no i when i experience another person's brokenness or see it's just so humbling i have nothing but compassion and love and grace for that person because i've been in that place and i know that you can try to do all the right things or think you're making the best decisions and and you can still just wind up in really hurtful places and so i definitely think it's kind of like dominoes as we heal and recover then we can turn and and help the next person and then they can turn and help the next person and, and so on I kind of liken it to uh, hiking a mountain. We do that a lot as a family. Okay. It's kind of like I'm a little bit further up the trail. You know, I haven't reached the peak yet, but I'm a little bit further ahead. And (laughs) and I want to go back to some people who are um, not quite as far up the trail as I am and say, hey, watch your step there. I fell in that hole and and twisted my ankle. Don't do that. And come out this way. This way is easier than going that way. And just kind of helping be like a trail guide for other people. And so that we can like work together and do this this journey together and press onward. And yes, as we're helping other people, that is so healing to us personally too. It is I just can't describe the deep level of fulfillment it is when when God uses you to minister in somebody else's life. It's like I mean that's better than whatever pleasure the world could give you of you know money or a great job or your family or whatever. It's just you know knowing that God has used your life to touch somebody else's life is really can be addictive (laughs) and uh yes i definitely enjoy that that's great that's great i think there's there's so much information that they've heard today and taken into perspective to know that you're not alone first of all and there's somebody who's watching over you like you mentioned you know god is watching over each and every one of us and say hey don't use this route why am I in traffic today? If you were probably taking this exit, something would have happened, you know? So it's like be on that self-defense by the same time, full of gratitude moment where you're now saying, Hey, this is what I think I should do. And because God is directing your path, just like my dad always tells me that whenever you leave the house, you, you know, you pray before you leave and thank him when you come back, because you never know when you're going to come back home. You don't want to, you, de- you don't know the story. Like, Today could be it, tomorrow could be it, but you don't want to be thinking like that every day without having to know that there's somebody watching over you so that you can actually live your best life and then live a life that's worth living for other people to follow. Yes, yeah, we're guaranteed very few things in life, but we are guaranteed that God will always be with us. 
and I, that is a big thing that I learned is that even when I thought I was alone, I thought he had abandoned me. He was not. He was there holding my hand the whole time. I just I couldn't see it. I couldn't sense it at that time because I was in so much pain. But now looking back, I see it. So yeah, to that person who's out there struggling right now, going, I just don't feel God. That's okay that you don't feel His presence. He's still there. Yeah, and omnipresent and always ready to answer. Just say a quiet prayer. You know, anywhere in the car. When you wake up, it's it's like a it's like a relationship that you don't want to ignore because once you ignore it, it kind of changes your your mindset because it's like oh I'm talking to my best friend today, but if God is also your best friend or your 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 father, which is you know the ultimate, then you know that you can get your problem solved because a bird today had their breakfast because God took care of that. So it's those little things that you just say this is nature and God knows why we're here. So once we build that success model. It builds success throughout our lives. And you being on the podcast today has been a great, great, great honor. I can't wait to be on yours. So whenever you're ready, let me know. And yeah, it's also Christmas season. So I know everybody is up and running, especially for you. I don't know how it's going to be looking, but I'm sure it's going to be full of fun, excitement, joy, and just just blessings, you know, overflowing. Yes, yes. Thank you for having me on today. This has been really nice chatting with you. You're welcome. Anytime. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being on here. And I'm wishing you a wonderful Christmas and, you know, the rest of the month. And, of course, a great 2021 in advance. And, of course, your book as well. Congratulations in advance. Thank you. You're welcome. And I look forward to the next one. All right. All right. Take care. We'll be in touch. Yes. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye. You guys have heard it first from... But we don't play station where we don't play every day. <laughs> yeah, we don't play at all. So you guys stay in tune. I hope you guys enjoy this podcast. Rate this podcast.com forward slash we don't play. And we're definitely going to keep you guys in check. Check out the podcast that's coming to you. If you're having a wonderful weekend, stay having a wonderful weekend. If you're feeling a little bit off the bat, off the edge, you know, just don't don't be sitting down there just thinking about things that are not profitable just be in that moment where you can be like okay i can make sense out of this sentence and still make sense out of tomorrow's sentence because you apply today's sentence in today's moment so think about those things and i really really appreciate you guys for tuning in so with no much further ado it's been your host flave beats my name is favor basi ek I'm just going to say this once and for all. Have a wonderful day and have a Merry Christmas in advance. And I'll be here, of course, next week. It's also my birthday week next week. So it's a lot going to happen. It's a lot going to happen. It's a lot going to happen. And um, when things happen, you know, you have to just thank God for life and be grateful because this year has been tough. But I think we've been tougher because we have a tough God and we have the toughest source of our life being and that is you know staying in connection with ourselves and being human beings that can be able to leave an impact because god loved us first so yeah guys i'm a deuces out from here and um i'll see you guys in the next show god bless and have a wonderful wonderful weekend stay safe peace